What's going on guys, welcome back to The Trank. Today I've got a pretty cool idea envisioned. I, when you're making pens, you've got a ton of tiny little components that you need to keep organized and keep in good condition. So I'm gonna be making a really cool tray divider that's really fancy with uh, blue flocking in it. So it's gonna be a cool project. Please subscribe to my channel guys so we can get this channel growing. Let's go ahead and jump into the video. Okay, so I had a large piece of the red oak left over from the workbench build. If you didn't see that, I'll leave a link here so you can check that out. And it's really, it's a, it's a nice hardwood, but it's not too expensive unlike some other hardwoods. So it's more readily obtained for those that are a little bit low on money. Um, I'm cutting this into the proper dimensions, a little oversized to fit that laser cut template you saw there. So I, I bottled up that template and just cut it at a local makerspace on the laser cutter. And then in order to joint the two edges for the glue up, I'm just putting them side by side in the vise here and planing those so that they become perfectly flat and should go together pretty much seamless. And it only takes a few passes to get it flat and then I just use the sole of my plane to check for any spots and once it looks good, I continue on to the glue up. Now here I made a big mistake which is gluing up these outside in the garage where it was probably a, about 40 degrees and turns out the PVA glue does not cure correctly in these lower temperatures and so what you're seeing here is the first of three glue ups that I actually ended up doing on this before it actually stayed together and you'll see by the end of the video that that crept up to cause few more issues on and on on this project but for now we'll skip past it. So I also have a laser cut template for the main handle piece here. So I'm using some painter's tape and then CA glue to just put this on to a thinner piece of red oak that I had. I then bring this over to the table saw and cut it to the proper width. And then I start hogging out material where the actual insert for the uh, hand insert is going to be. And so I use a Forstner bit that's approximately 1 16th inch smaller in diameter than the slot that I'm going to be cutting. That way I have enough wiggle room to cut it without too much measurement and then just clean it up with the flush trim bit on the router table. So once that material is hogged away, I bring it over to the router table and I just use a flush trim bit to ride across that template and cut this to the uh, exact cutout. I then repeat the same process off screen. I cut uh, using a bandsaw at work. I, I cut the outer profile close to what it should be. And then again, I cleaned it up at the router table. I tried to use my jigsaw at first and really failed. I hate jigsaws, so I'll probably never be using it again. And then because this was just taken from a piece of scrap wood that I had laying around, I had to take off this piece of overhang. And so I just ran this carefully through the table saw to uh, get that flush. I could then bring it into the proper thickness, so I apply a little paste wax to the bed of the planer uh, just to help the piece run smoothly, and then I just run that, few, a few to run that through a few times in order to get that to the proper dimension. And while that was done for now, I continued back to the main tray portion, so here the glue up's finished, and I could just go ahead and square up the size of that on the tape saw. And then I also cut it to the proper width, just riding along the fence here. And then I bring it over and use a card scraper to clean up the glue joint. And I've been using the card scraper more and more and I just really love it. Um, it works really well at what it does. It saves you a lot of time sanding. And you know, it, it's a lot of people say it leaves you a finished ready surface. I haven't necessarily experienced that in every circumstance, but it definitely does leave a good surface. And you can see here, once that glue joint was cleaned up, um, the joint had all but disappeared. I then ran this through the planer a lot more times than you're going to see here because I ended up bringing this into a final dimension of about an inch and a quarter and it started at closer to two inches. So probably spent a good 40 minutes just running through that, running that through the planer. And you can see here, once it was done, the opposing face was nice and parallel and cleaned up. So I'm going to be using a sliding dovetail to attach the handle to the tray bottom. And what I really should have done here was use a straight bit to hog out the majority of that material. I didn't know that at this point, so I just went ahead straight with the dovetail bit. 
Um, and you can see that slight offset from center, that's going to actually bring an issue later. I then used some cutoff from the handle to dial in the offset on the fence in order to get a perfect fit on the sliding dovetail. And this took a lot of micro adjustment and several test cuts, but it pays to do this on scrap before you go to the real piece. And once I had that dialed in here, you can see that once it's lined up, it is pretty much a perfect little joint. So then I brought in the real handle to make the cut. Again, you have to be careful here. You have to keep it really snug up against the fence to make sure you get an even pass. And it was a little tricky. I also used that same cutoff to uh, take care of avoiding any tear out on the back end of the router. Luckily, it went pretty smoothly and it was a little looser than the test fit was, but it was still plenty tight, especially once you put some glue in and the wood swells a bit, it's gonna be plenty strong and tight. I then used the template to mark off roughly where the compartments are going to be so that I can start applying painter's tape to actually glue on the template. Now I'm using a bowl carving dish bit and this is essentially a box core bit with a large bearing on it. And I was a little worried, um, I knew I was going to take these compartments out in several passes, but I was still a little worried about the amount of material that the bit's cutting. I wasn't sure if it was going to be a lot of force. Luckily, it was actually a really easy bit to use and I didn't feel like there was a lot of stress on the router and on the bit as a whole. Uh, now having a dust chute here would have really helped because I pretty much had to take it out every like 20 seconds and clear out all the dust chips because it was just so dusty. If I had had a shroud, it could have sucked it all up. And, this whole process probably would have gone a lot faster. Alternatively, if you have access to some sort of uh, CNC, you could probably cut these out in no time. Uh, but doing it by hand works fine. It just did take a, probably about an hour and a half of routing. And after the main material was hogged out, I always made a light pass around the perimeter just being careful to carefully ride that template to make sure all the compartments were the same dimension. I could then peel off the template and slowly peel off the tape to reveal a nice, nice uh, templated, nice compartment side of the tray. I then had to, of course, repeat this whole process off camera on the other side. Here you can see the insane amount of dust that this made in the garage. Literally everything in the garage was coated in sawdust. Um, <laughs> luckily, I could at least get the stuff up off the floor, but uh, that's going to be sitting on the other stuff for a while. Before continuing on, I just did a little bit of cleanup on the edges, mainly just getting rid of those little bit of hairs that come off. Now I had to take this time while nothing was there to tape off the corners to get ready for flocking later. And I thought I have a clever trick here. I actually took the bearing off the router bit and used that as a template for cutting these corners for the tape. That way I could apply these to the tray and have them be the exact fit on the corner of those compartments. Now that was a very tedious process and um, it wasn't very fun. Now I could start shifting my attention to some of the lids for the tray. So I'm using um, a piece of cherry here to, to make the two lids and I, it's a pretty rough piece of cherry so there's a lot of cleanup involved. You can see them serious burning there on the edge and this is just how it came from the lumber yard. So I clean up the um, edges a bit with the hand plane and I tried to take care of most of that burning with the card scraper. And again, using the card scraper here saved a lot of time. It would have taken a long time and you probably would have gotten some divots if you had tried to do this with a sander. Now here you can see that slight offset from center created an overhang there which I didn't notice until this point. Um, the funny thing is, is it was actually compensated for on the other side, so actually using a flush trim bearing here to cut that off didn't end up making them not um, mirrored across the longitudinal axis, but it actually made them even, so that kind of worked out nice. I could then use an awl to mark out the holes, and I'm going to be drilling out some small holes with a Forstner bit to apply, or to glue in some 3 8 neodymium, neodymium magnets. This is going to hold the lids down to the tray and before doing anything else I also take care of the edges. I put a chamfer on the bottom side and a round over on the top side. And then I do the same thing to the main tray here, applying a nice chamfer to the underside and a slight chamfer to the top side. That way when the two chamfers meet, if there's any misalignment between the lid and the tray, it'll be hidden by the chamfer. So that's kind of a sneaky little technique to use. 
I then bring the tray handle over and round over all the surfaces. You want to be real careful here, keeping you know keeping an eye on your fingers and making sure it's a good distance away from the bit and make sure you're cutting in the proper direction as to not cause any kick or anything. It's a little scary, but as long as you're careful, you'll be fine. The round over doesn't take uh, much material off at all. So here you can see things were coming together pretty well. Now I had to start the flocking process, so I reused the templates I used to cut the compartments as a sort of protection against applying the heat adhesive to the top side. Now going back, I would have taped off everything to make this even cleaner. Um, you'll see I did get a little bit of the flock outside of the uh, intended area, but I cleaned that up and it ended up being fine, but I would, I would recommend taping everything off. So to flock, you basically apply this thick adhesive and it has a couple minutes, you know, 10 minute, I think, set time. Uh, so what I would do is apply adhesive to a couple compartments and then apply a generous amount of the fibers uh, because you want to make sure you get it completely covered. Once that it's set overnight, I could come and knock off all the excess fibers. And I do this into a cardboard box here so that I can, of course, reuse those fibers for future projects. I then took off the templates and removed all the bits and corners and it turned out quite well. There's just a few spots you can see here where the blue got up on the surface and I go ahead and take care of those areas with the card scraper. Now this was really easy to do on these longer areas here where I had some actual contact area. It was a lot harder on the edges here where I didn't really have space to kind of get the card scraper started so I kind of chipped away at it as I could until they were all cleaned up. And you can see how well the fibers are stuck here because I run my shop or my dust collector through and none of the fibers come up or anything. So they really do do a good job of uh, staying put. With all the parts done, I just started sanding things, getting all the edges taken care of and getting ready for finish. I applied some tongue oil off camera. I lost the footage for it. Um, and so I just wiped down everything with mineral spirits to clean it up and applied two coats of tongue oil. Lastly, I could cut out some fancy leather I got from a shoe repair shop near me. They had some scraps, so I had cut this red leather off and applied it to the underside of the lids. That way, all the pen parts in the tray, even if turned upside down or anything, is being protected by either the fibers or the leather on all sides, so it's going to keep it uh, nice, and, nice and secure, and it'll look really nice too. Here I'm gluing in the magnets to the lids before I apply the leather. The leather is going to act as a barrier to help you know, if you were just doing magnet on magnet, it'd be really hard to get the lid off, but putting in the leather between applies just the, amount, the right amount of resistance to secure the lid in place, but still allow you to take it off pretty easily. I use contact cement to adhere it to the lid. With those on, I could cut off the excess around the outside of the lid taking care to not accidentally cut into the fibers of the wood. So you want to be real careful here because it's really easy to let that blade slip and mess things up. I could then glue in the handle and at this point I applied finish to the top so that I could get rid of any glue that came out. And I basically just applied a bead of glue on the dovetail and, and then I used some clamping pads here to protect the surface while I clamped those down. The very last step was to apply the magnets to the tray itself, being care to check for the proper polarity so that the lid would actually uh, attach to the tray. And with that, it was done. Here are some final shots of the project. Okay, that's going to do it for this project. I'm pretty happy with how this turned out. There is one problem that's going on, which is because of the uh, drying of the red oak, it's actually starting to split along that seam that I took so much time to make sure that it was perfect and that's starting to split. So that's too bad. I hope the tray stays together. 
If it doesn't, I guess I'll have to make another, but I'm happy with how it turned out. So if you enjoyed this project, be sure to subscribe to my channel, guys. Follow me on my Instagram. I'm gonna leave links to those below. Uh, it'll really help uh, get my channel growing. So thanks for watching as always, and we'll see you on the next video. Okay, so first things first, if you made it this far in the video, thanks for watching. I'm going to be adding this portion to the end of my videos. It basically reviews some of the mistakes that I made and how to fix them in the future. First one I mentioned before, which is being sure to tape off those areas where you're going to do the flocking because even with that template attached, you can see it still spilled over in some areas and they were almost impossible to remove it. The next thing is to clear out the waist for a sliding dovetail joint with a straight bit. Now this is a common practice to do, but I didn't know it at the time, but it would have saved a lot of stress cutting that joint. It would probably make it cleaner. Very last thing is that when I was actually routing out the compartment profiles, I would often have to remove the router in order to clear out the dust, and I would be keep the router spinning while I removed it, and that would sometimes, I would accidentally nick the edge of that, and that's what created these divots here. So being careful to stop the router bit before removing it from the compartment down the road. Thanks for watching.